Oh, recording. Um, yeah, shout out to the English language programs. I'm an English language fellow uh, representing the United States Embassy here in Poland, and, and also a, a visiting teacher at the University of Gdansk. And so I, I start off with just, um, let me see if I can get this to move here. Is it moving? Oh, there we go. Did it move? Yeah, it's moving. Everything. All right, is there we go. Um, starting off with a question. How, I just want everyone to consider for a moment if they've ever tried to teach the concept of irony or, or meta in your classroom. And, and if you have and, and you're reflecting back on that, um, it probably wasn't very easy, right? And, and even if you tried to offer the definitions, you know, a striking reversal of what is expected or intended or showing a suggestion of explicit awareness of itself, uh, seeing those definitions in the abstract um, is kind of meaningless. It, it doesn't really help learners to understand what these things are. And that's because you, you need examples and, and you need a lot of examples and you need to see it over and over again. So even before you can begin to define these words, you need to show them actually happening in, in the real world. And I submit that the teaching writing is the same way. You, you can't give definitions of the thing that the students are trying to write before uh, you actually give them a chance to read it or write it. And so I want to ask, um, and, it, you know, obviously no one has to answer, but just reflect on if you have learned to write like the slides I'm about to show you in a moment. I'll, I'll refer to them as the conventional slide deck. Um, these conventional slide decks very much reflect the way that I learned how, how to write um, back in my university days. Uh, these slides from the conventional slide deck I'm going to show you are, are based on authentic slides that were given to me by one of my former institutions to teach uh, in my composition classes. And um, I, get, I guess what I'm trying to say is that I, I want you to look at these and ask yourself if this is the way you learned how to write. And I want to emphasize that none of the information on these slides I'm about to show you is, is wrong or incorrect. It has a lot of really good information. Uh, what I'm trying to challenge is, is there a better way we can do this? And <laughs> this is going to transport you back to your learning days. So, so do me a favor and try not to fall asleep as we click through these. So here we go, the conventional slide deck. Um, the topic is formal essays, and um, I'll kick it off. And I'll, 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 I'll basically go through what I'm thinking and what my students might be thinking during each one of the slides as they go through. So in this, in this slide deck that was handed to me by my old institution, the first thing they wanted me to do, the first slide I would show my students is the three types of the formal essays. And the three types are the opinion essay, the solutions to problem essay, and the four and against essay. And me as the teacher standing up in the front of the classroom, the, the first thing I see on my students is, is skeptical eyes. And I think that's because if you ask most L2 writers of English, they, they will tell you right up front that they are not confident in their writing ability. And the idea of English writing is intimidating to L2 writers. And so when they see a slide that says, we're going to learn three kinds of essays in one day, uh, they're immediately thinking, I don't know if I'm capable of doing that. And, and I don't know if I'm confident in doing that. Not to mention writing is never really very much fun anyway. So I'm sure a lot of the students are also thinking like, Ugh, I hate writing. Uh, there's going to be three of these coming up. So the next slide immediately that I have to show these students is number one, the opinion essay. And, and just getting a look at this, you're thinking, wow, that's too much, right? Uh, we have this big definition on the opinion essay. Uh, it necessitates an opinion on a topic, provides several viewing points. 
and uh, you need to provide a opposing viewpoint. And then it has the different types of paragraphs you would incorporate into um, that type of essay. So I'm looking at the students now and, and I'm immediately seeing two different kinds of students, the two different kinds of students that exist in my classroom. I see the studious students who immediately, if they have a laptop in front of them, they start typing rapidly because they're trying to just write down this definition before I click away to the next slide. And then I see the less engaged students and I watch their eyes glaze over and, and maybe even I see them already eyeballing the, the cell phone that's in their pocket. So um, I, I read through the definition because that's all I really can do. And, and I watch these students frantically try to write down this and, and not even really attempt to, to memorize it. And then the next slide gives some opinion essay topics that students might see. And, and at this point, I'm thinking in my head, uh, how are we talking about topics? Uh, we've just defined it and we haven't even seen what this thing might look like yet. And, and I'm sure if I'm in my students' heads, I'm thinking they're looking at these topics and they're saying, okay, topic number one, should high school graduates go to college? Topic number two, are school uniforms necessary? Uh, topic number three is food preparation, making the world a better or worse place. I, I'm willing to bet, I would wager that these topics are not exciting to my students. I don't think they're passionate about these topics. So not only are they disengaged with the slides and the information heavy slides, they're also looking at these topics and saying, these aren't really relevant to, or, or not really relating to what I'm passionate about as a university student. And then immediately, um, as quickly as possible, we switch right over to essay number two, which is the solutions to problems essay. And we have another big definition where um, a problem is introduced and the solution is offered. Uh, we have the different paragraphs that go into this essay again. And, and it's the same deal as before. On my end, all I can really do to help my students out is read this slide. And the students are probably already frustrated and overwhelmed with slide number one. Now they reach number two. And all they can do again is just take notes as quickly as possible instead of actually thinking these through. Also, with the amount of information happening on number two here, I'm willing to bet most of my students have already forgotten what definitely the definition of the opinion essay is. And maybe they even forgot that number one was the opinion essay. After I read this and click to the next slide, uh, I have a slide that just has useful language for the solution to problem essay. Uh, and here we can just see a bunch of words that are helpful. You know, I'm not saying they're not helpful, but to see them not in context and to see them before we've ever even looked at one of these essays uh, seems like a bit too early. And again, all my students can really do is write down as many of these as possible without thinking about what they actually mean before I hit this next slide. And here uh, again, there'll be some example topics. Uh, again, not really engaging, although I'll give some credit to number two with cyberbullying. I think that's something that reaches the news a lot and, and I think students can relate to and, and would be interested in exploring. Uh, but as far as life choices and coworkers are concerned, may, maybe less so. And now, just when we start, we think we understand number two, we jet over to number three, the for and against essay. Um, another big block of a definition. All I can really do is read it. And all my students can do is write it down as quickly as possible. So now we've seen three different definitions for three different types of essays. Um, we haven't really got into what they look like, how long they're supposed to be. Um, the register of, of language that's being used. All we know are these abstract definitions. And I'm willing to bet if I held an essay up and passed it around to the students, uh, they would struggle to even identify which one of the essays they're looking at because they haven't even seen one yet. 
we have some best practices for writing these essays, which would be helpful if, if we had a minute to digest and think about it. And then we have a great list of do's, a great list of suggestions for writing these essays. But um, just looking at these seven or eight bullets right now, um, students won't even have a chance to, to write these down. Uh, the best they can hope is that I will publish this online in some way so that they can go back and look at this when it actually matters to them and helps them. Same thing with the don'ts. It's just a lot of information before the students even have a chance to use it. And then there's this great phrase bank, which I actually like. I think there's a lot of really good stuff in here. It's just um, seeing it out of context and then in, in something this size, there's no way my students are walking away with any of this. So, so that is the conventional slide deck. And again, I, I've really had to use that in the classroom. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have experienced something like that as well. That's also the way that I, I learned how to write and I'm willing to bet that that's the same for most of us here. And um, I, I think we have this notion that, well, if it worked for us, that, that's okay. You know, I, I consider myself to be uh, a relatively good writer. I'm sure most of you do as well. And so we're saying, well, if it worked for us, then you know, it works for everyone. And, and I agree that it does work, but I think we can always improve. And, and I think uh, I've found a, a way to improve this a little bit. I don't wanna make it sound like I invented this. Um, I've stumbled across research and research has been taught to me where I think there's a better way to do this. And so my gripes with this conventional slide deck, the, the problems I think I see in it is that uh, as far as student engagement goes, I, I think they're barely hanging in there. Um, it's almost 100% lecturing. Uh, the students have no agency at all. It's not about them at all. And, and to them, I'm sure they're thinking this is very boring. On top of that, on my end, um, I don't really like lecturing for one hour, one hour, 30 minutes puts the whole weight of the lesson on my shoulders. Uh, I'm responsible for everything that happens in this classroom. I get exhausted. Uh, my throat starts to dry out, especially when I need to teach three of these lessons in a row. And then on top of that, I have to play police officer also, right? Where I'm doing these lectures, I'm reading the slides, and then I'm looking around to room to, to make sure students aren't playing on their phones or chatting or whatever, whatever it is they do when they're not engaged. Uh, second gripe, it's overload. You saw how much information was on those slides. Even learning one of those essays would have been a lot. And we did three of them in one setting. Uh, and then, yeah, all the text and then the three types of essays, it's just too much. And then my, my big gripe, I think the one I would complain about the most is just there's no context or examples in all of these definitions I'm giving out, right? I, I mean, even if we manage to, to memorize in one sitting those three types of essay definitions, um, we, do, we, we don't know what, we, what they look like and, and we don't know how to write it yet. Um, it's great information, it all works. Um, it's just, it, we, we can't apply it yet. All we see are these definitions that are in the abstract, just like irony and meta, right? We don't really know. I mean, we have the definitions. We don't really know what it means until we actually see it in action. And what we're needing also is, is authenticity. So um, these examples that, that I want my students to see, uh, I, I want them to be not fabricated, not from a textbook. I want them to be the, the real deal and hopefully um, some way engaging to my students maybe something on, on cyberbullying or um, I see chat GPT in the news a lot. Um, that might be a topic that's interesting to explore. Um, but now I wanna get into uh, the story of the resume, which is the last genre of writing I can really recall learning. Um, I learned how to re uh, write most formal texts when I was in college, uh, but they never really taught me how to write the resume. So I was recalling how that happened for me. And this is back in probably 2011. 
I needed a job. Uh, I had just graduated college. And I remember in college, either my third or fourth year, I had some kind of class where they said, um, we're going to teach you how to write a resume today. And it was very similar to the conventional slide deck I showed you, right, where they told us what a resume was. They said, here are the things you do when you write a resume. Uh, here are the things you should not do when you write a resume. And then I'm sure I wrote one and submitted it. And um, maybe I got some feedback from my professor. Uh, I got a decent enough grade where I, I believed that I understood uh, what a writing a resume was all about. And so I said, OK, good enough. I think I get it. And when I applied for my jobs, I sent this resume out. And I wasn't receiving any feedback. Uh, or, or no one was contacting back to me with any job offers. And, and at first, maybe I blame that on getting a liberal arts education. And I said, man, I, I know I, I should have went STEM, damn. Um, but as I humbled myself more and more and I saw more of my liberal arts friends get jobs, I said, okay, maybe it's me, maybe it's my resume. So what I did was, um, and, and I think it was the logical thing to do. I found one of my friends who got a job and I said, hey, let me see your resume. And he said, okay, and he handed it to me. And, and I looked at it and then I looked at mine and I said, okay, his does not look like mine. And there are a lot of things that he's doing in his that I like that are not in mine. And so I did what every great person has ever done is I took a bunch of good ideas and I copied it and I put it in my own work, and I put my own little spin on it. So I took the things I liked from his resume that I wasn't doing in mine, and I inserted them to mine, and I sent mine out, and I was getting a little better responses, but still not the amount of responses I liked. So then what I did was I talked to all my friends and said, hey, everybody, give me a resume. And now I have a pile of six or seven resumes in front of me, and I'm looking at all of them and I'm saying, okay, what's everyone doing? Am I doing that? Maybe I am, maybe I'm not, but if everyone's doing it and they're all successful, I should probably do it too. So I make sure I have all the essentials I need. And then after that, I start looking at stylistic things, right? I say, oh, that's a good idea. I like how we put education at the top. Or um, I like the way that just this is organized. And so, I've taken all the essentials, I have what I absolutely need, and then I start making stylistic choices and applying it to my own resume until I have my unique original resume. And I sent it out, and then what do you know, 12, 13 years later, here I am um, in this webinar talking with all of you. So I think that resume story was a success story. And I think <clears throat> the reason it was was because um, I didn't really, even though I received instruction on how to write a resume, I didn't really understand what I was doing until I actually looked at real world resumes that, that I trusted and I, and I knew were successful. The first thing I did was I found the commonalities that all of the resumes shared. And then when making stylistic choices, I started self-assessing, okay, which one is doing the thing that I like the most, I'm gonna steal that. Uh, I like how he put this up here instead of down there. I'm gonna steal that. And then I assembled everything in a way where I felt like I had created a new product and I felt like I was representing myself. And in the L2 writing teaching business, um, they would call what I did using model texts. And the model text is an authentic text that serves an example, serves as an example for student writers. Uh, it should be modeled as a good piece of writing, although it can be modeled as a bad piece of writing, but you should always do that after you've shown the positive examples. Um, the goal to providing writing to a student um, is to, to, to let them emulate their own writing after this model. And almost anything can serve as a model as long as it in some way represents the goal of the genre that you are working towards. Um, the step-by-step -step process looks something like um, 
a model is presented to a student. They notice the, the structure and overall language use and conventions. And then they analyze those convections on, on the purpose of using them. Then the students begin to categorize those conventions um, so that they can assign it to one specific genre. Then students start to incorporate the conventions in their own personal writing. And then lastly, students feel supported because these authentic texts they were using, they've seen their decisions used in, in real life texts and they know, okay, if I'm doing it, um, that's okay because other people do it too. I feel validated in my decision-making. Um, I like model texts. I use them in my classroom. And if one slide was to be my, my thesis, this one would be it. Uh, students understand better and more completely when they interact with authentic real world examples of texts in lessons. Um, it keeps things student centered. Uh, the students are the ones hunting for these commonalities. I'm not dictating to the students anything. Uh, they are in charge of their own learning. Uh, they assess the choices themselves and they take what they like. Of course, I'm there for guidance. I make sure no one is going astray, but the students are the ones who are in charge of getting the information they need out of these texts. And I think it lets them find their voice by playing with new ideas and strategies that they see in other texts. And again, with guidance, if I see students going off course, I'm still there. I'm the teacher. I will guide them back on course. Here's a quote I like, the ability to find good writing and identify what makes it effective will carry students through their education and into the world of work. And the world of work is the important thing, right? So I want the students to be able to take this out of the classroom and actually have strategies that are useful to them once they leave the classroom. Uh, they should be able to learn things on their own and not wait for people educators to tell them how to learn how to read or write new things. Um, if you're anything like me, when you come to these conferences or these uh, webinars, um, you're secretly crossing your fingers that someone will walk through a lesson that you can steal and use in your own classroom. Maybe steal is too strong a word, but um, Usually when I'm in these, these presentations, I'm saying, hopefully there's a lesson I can yank out of here and apply to my classroom. And, and I also think it would be a little bit hypocritical for me to say to you, uh, PowerPoints are bad, lecturing is bad, without showing some examples of my own. So um, I thought it would be interesting to kind of turn my story of my resume learning experience uh, into a lesson, what it would look like in the classroom. And I think the way I would go about doing that is I would present some kind of model or example, uh, in this case, a resume. <clears throat> Excuse me. I would ask, what is the purpose of this text that we were looking at? You know, what's it trying to accomplish? Uh, how is it attempting to accomplish this purpose? Then I would explain what genre we're looking at. And then I would just start piling on more models. And I would have the students comparing and contrasting the models and evaluating them on their own. So first thing I would do, I don't know how big this is on your screens, but uh, the information is important outside of just the overall structure. So I would show this to my students. I would say, what are we looking at? And hopefully some hands would go up and a student would respond, I know that, that's a resume. And I would say, nice job. And then I would ask the students, what is the purpose of writing a resume? Why do people write resumes? Hopefully some more hands would go up and hopefully we would get a list going that looks something like this, right? People write a resume to sell themselves or to represent their skills in a positive way, uh, to land a job, and, and most importantly, to make tons of money. That's why I wrote my resume. And that's why I got into education for, for the big checks. Um, so once we have that list, I ask them, what makes a resume a resume? You know, what are those things that resumes do to help achieve their goal? We already saw one resume. Now we look at a bunch. 
And what I'm asking the students to do is look for things that all of these resumes are doing. What, is, what does a resume need to have in order to call itself a resume? So I let the students scan these. Um, you can play this game too, if you want, but just look at certain things that are happening in this resume that you see across all three. Um, what is it about a resume that makes it a resume? And I would hopefully have my students find things like, look at that right up top, we have the names. Um, it's the biggest text on the resume. So right at the top, big font names. Um, under that is usually the job the person is hunting for. Um, bullets, lots and lots of bullets. Um, these ones are all colorful. They all have colors in some way. And of course, there is at least one section that's titled work history, uh, the previous jobs the person has held. And then I asked the students, which one do you like best, uh, especially for a genre like resumes, where there is no official best way to do a resume. It depends on who is doing the hiring. So I let the students decide this for themselves. And uh, I give the students the opportunity, you know, do you like Wallace? Do you like Elizabeth? Do you like Dante? They all have the essentials for the resume, but um, they're all taking personal choices too, right? Um, Wallace, for example, has this nifty thing that I've never seen before where he has a rating system for his own skills and he's rating himself out of five. And I, I like that he was being generous to himself, uh, never going below a four in any category. Um, I don't really know what the point of uh, evaluating your skills are if, if you're not gonna go before, uh, below a four in any category. But I I'll tell you one thing, it was memorable and um, that's probably what he's going for. It's definitely a unique thing to do. Uh, Elizabeth puts a photo on her resume, uh, not necessary for resume, but uh, she put it on there and it's a nice touch. Uh, it, puts, it puts a face to the name. It adds a little more humanity to an otherwise kind of boring document. And then we have Dante, who is the um, supreme minimalist. Almost no colors at all, no picture, uh, just the facts. And, and I was thinking about this, who am I most like? And I'm probably a Dante man. I think that uh, uh, th there's nothing jazzy about my resume. And maybe that's why it took me two years to get hired out of uh, college, but so it goes. But the point is I, I let my students decide which one they like best and which stylistic choices they want to incorporate into their own resume writing. Um, Another fun idea maybe for this would be to set up a, a four corners debate where you have the students who like Wallace maybe go into one corner and the students who like Elizabeth, they go into another corner and the Dante people go into another corner. And then all of the people who are in that corner huddle up and they discuss why they think their resume choice is the best. And then we'll have an open debate where students, students will share ideas with one another. And who knows, maybe some minds will change and the students are free to go to a different corner depending on um, how the debate goes. So there's a lot of ways you can go with that. Um, I could have them build their own do's and don'ts list. So we as a class start deciding, okay, what's something everyone likes? And if there's something that every single person in this classroom agrees is a good idea, Bam, we put it in the do section. Uh, if there's something that everyone in the classroom agrees is a bad idea, then boom, we put it in the don'ts category. So we're making our own decisions on what makes a quality resume. Um, we can even build a class rubric for evaluating resumes. We could take a vote on the class for what we think is the most five most essential characteristics of a resume. Uh, we talked about memor memorability could be one, uh, organization, um, the, the conciseness. Um, we get five categories and then we grade the resumes that we have in front of us. And then we can get even more models going and we can start grading more models and seeing which ones we like based on the rubric we created. 
um, going back to that conventional uh, slide deck I showed you earlier, the one that the uh, old institution had given to me. Um, I, I want to prove to you now that it's it's not the information that's in there that's that's I think I don't even want to say wrong, but um, the information there's nothing wrong with that. I just think the way it's presented could be improved and. What I've tried to do now is come up with a few short lessons where I convey that same information, but in a way that I think is engaging and will stick with the students longer than it takes to get to the next slide. Um, these are just the slides restructured. So what I might do first, if I was going to teach a formal essay, is just give the students a sample of the essay, you know, get it right in their hands immediately. Um, and you can take a, a second to read this if, if you want, but um, what, what, I'm, what I'm saying is uh, I, I would tell the students, what is an author trying to do here? And then this is a, this is a real life student sample um, that I've asked for consent to use this. And so the students would know they're looking at a real student writing a real essay uh, there's nothing inauthentic about this. So I have them read this and I say, what does the student want to do with this essay? Why did the student write this essay? And hopefully the students would come to this kind of conclusion. Um, they would say that the person who wrote this essay does not want me to buy cryptocurrency. Um, how do I know that? I can look at the title, would be a dead giveaway. How to lose time, money, and energy. I mean, people like time and money and energy, so it's not something we would want to lose. And then if you look at the thesis, upon further analysis, there are virtually no advantages to cryptocurrencies as they are not good alternative to cash. Uh, they affect the environment negatively, lack stability, and are corrupt. And then I bring out the definitions. I say, take a look at these definitions. Which one, which formal essay do you think we just looked at? Uh, I let the students read them through and hopefully they arrive at one, right? So there was an opinion. It was don't buy cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency is bad. Um, it provided several reasons or examples like it's bad for the environment and it's corrupt and it's unstable. Um, this way, I'm letting the students see what the essay actually looks like, and then we'll start figuring out what it's called and how to define it. Uh, one more example of, of taking the information that was in that original slide deck and doing something with it that I think will be a little stickier with the students. And this one is for the phrase bank. And like I said, I, I like that phrase bank. I think all the words are good, but I don't think you just get to throw them at the students. I think there's a way you need to ease the students into it through looking at texts. So it might look something like this, right? Um, I show the students the list of words and I ask them, what do these words have in common? And normally this would look less messy, but um, I wanted to take a screen grab of that phrase bank so that you could see I haven't changed anything at all. It is identical to what we saw earlier. It's just presented in a new way. All I did was blank out the actual category title, which is adding ideas. So um, the other caveat is normally we would be looking at larger blocks of text here with my students, but for just the way this format is working, um, we can only really get one paragraph in here, but it, it's good enough for um, this presentation. And if it's an idea you like, you can just use larger chunks of texts. But I have the list for the students and I say, do you see any of these words in the text? And you can uh, play the game. You can try to hunt them down, see how many you can find.
Hello, hello. I can't hear you. Suddenly your voice disappeared. Oh, no. Do, do you have me? Yes, I have you now. Okay. okay. Sorry. Okay. So, um, yeah. So uh, you, you might discover um, there's at least two in here. You have moreover and furthermore. Uh, and then I would ask the students, you know, what are these words doing? Um, they're in there. Why are they in there? And I would say, check out the sentence that happens before. Uh, what, what kind of information is held in that sentence? And then what is the rest of the sentence with that word talking about? What's the relationship between the sentence before and the words that come after, moreover, or furthermore? And I would let the students arrive at that on their own. We would discuss it. We'd come to a class consensus. And then we'd say, okay, what is the function of the words on this list? And it would be adding ideas. And if we had a bigger chunk of text, we might um, find some more of these words and we might be able to compare and contrast the slight differences that these, these words have as function. So again, there, there's nothing wrong with the information that is in those uh, original conventional slide deck. It's just that uh, I think if we rethink the way those lessons work with models, uh, it's more effective for the students. They remember it better. They have more, more engagement doing it because they're not just listening to me talk. And it's less work for me because I don't have to talk for uh, one hour and 30 minutes every day, uh, multiple times a day because I have to keep doing the same class. So as far as ideas for uh, how this process would work, you'd start with something simple. Um, for university students, I think resume is a good jumping off point, um, especially for the students who are thinking about getting into the workforce soon. Um, you scaffold, you start with the simple stuff, you build to the more complex stuff. And, and I just wanted to show that it even works at a, an elementary level, you can do this. It doesn't need to be for formal essays. Uh, you can start, even in middle school, kids working on things like birthday cards. And then you could get a little more complicated with emails. And then you could get a little more complicated with letters. And you keep building to your end goal. And, and where these model texts come from, um, I don't know how familiar you are or if, if you've encountered this before, but it's based on this idea of genre theory. And, and in, in a brass tax, nuts and bolts ways of, of presenting it, I would say that genre theory is this idea that every text can be classified into some kind of writing. Um, for example, the resume is a genre. The opinion essay is the genre. Um, so is the solutions to problem essay. Even the birthday card would be a genre. And every genre is defined by the purpose of text in uh, the genre or like the, the conventions and the purpose that every text in the genre shares. And then the stylistic choices that might go on top of that. Um, understanding the purpose of the conventions of a genre is to be able to actually write in that genre. And then model texts, you consider those being the roadmap to the genre. So looking at the second quote down here at the bottom, uh, to write successfully in a genre, a writer must be familiar with its conventions of content structure and style as well as understand the assumptions. Um, model texts are how we become familiar with the genres, conventions, content, style, and structure. Um, where can you get these model texts? So what you saw were, were two of the ways to get them. You saw the resumes from the real world, and you saw the formal writing from a former student of mine. Uh, there's a third way to go about this, and that's teacher writing, which I'll talk about in a second. So uh, there's pluses and minuses to, to each way to get these model texts. Um, but the pluses for getting them from the wild would be to show the students like, hey, these things have been printed. These things exist in the real world. Um, someone, some kind of publishing house or some kind of uh, website thought this essay was good enough. They threw it up there. So if it's good enough for this publishing house, it's good enough for me. And it's probably good enough for you. Uh, it's authentic because you took it from the real world. And um, yeah, I said this before, uh, it, 
the students knowing that this can exist in the real world will give them the confidence to actually have them back up their own decision making. Uh, using student writing as model texts, you can draw from there. Um, you can save work from previous classes. That's what I like to do. Of course, make sure you ask consent. At the end of the year, I, I say to the students, um, if anyone is, is comfortable with me using your text for next year, I would love to use them. Of course, I will redact your name, um, but it's just I would like to use your text uh, to help the students next year. And, and most students will say yes to this. Uh, I get about um, one no for every 10, maybe. So, so even if you ask this once, you're going to walk away with something like 50 texts, and that's more than enough. Just make sure the students say yes. Um, you can use these examples. Uh, you can use your best ones and you can say, hey, kids, the, these, these, and you don't even have to tell them they're the strongest essays. You just say, take a look at this. What do you think? Do you like it? Uh, what is this person doing? Um, this is someone your age, so you can do it too. Um, or you could say, you know, how can we improve? Prove the student writing when we basically do a, a group peer edit. Um, you can also, if you want to use work from active students, that's something I've tried in the past. Uh, of course, don't use negative examples if there's a student in your class that, that you are sampling. Um, definitely ask, ask consent still, definitely redact the name, but you can tell the student if, if you would like to own this, you, you can, but definitely don't put them on the spot and throw their name up on the board uh, without asking them first. And then the last bit, which I think is, is an interesting fun twist, it's something I like to do with my students, is I'll show them my old writing. Uh, I'm lucky enough to have saved a lot of my undergraduate college writing. So I'll show this to, to the students and, and I'll say, maybe we have a, a rubric we made in this class and I'll say, take a look at my writing. What do you like that I'm doing? And, and what do you think I could do better? And, and the students always have a, a good time uh, ripping you up and, and pointing out some, some typos that you made. Um, but, but it just shows them that, you know, even the people who are teaching them make mistakes too, and no one's perfect. Uh, helps boost the students up. And, and just make sure you're not inventing writing uh, like, so, so I, I guess here's one more thing is, is even if you don't have writing saved, there's still a way to do this. Um, if you are sampling, for example, if you want to provide a model for formal writing, like the opinion essay, what you can do is um, just don't do very much pre-planning. Don't do much editing at the end. Just write an essay kind of um, free form and let your students see it and say, hey, I, I just wrote this last night, but definitely don't force any errors or try to lead students in any direction. Uh, I think that's still a way to do it and it's still a fun way for your students to, to see that you are human too and um, that, that, they, that, that your position is, is something that the students can eventually reach themselves. Um, <clears throat> sorry, just some quick tips. Um, be sure to scaffold these lessons. I mentioned this earlier, but start with something simple and work your way forwards. I like collaboration. You heard me talking about um, doing things as a class, right? Where um, you can create a do's and don'ts list as a class. But uh, for some of those activities like hunting down words, uh, sometimes it's good to get students in a group of three or four and have them hunt down the words together and then debate with one another uh, what the purpose of those words in that phrase bank actually do. Uh, I'm a big fan of collaboration. It helps students uh, just work out uh, meaning in a way that they can't necessarily do on their own. Um, for, for beginners, especially for uh, the middle school level, even the high school level, it doesn't hurt to read aloud the first time. It keeps the students engaged and um, helps them maybe sound out some words they haven't seen yet. Uh, Definitely be specific. When you're showing a model, don't just say, what do you think about this whole text? Um, you saw me before, I was saying, there's the thesis. We're looking at these words. So you start very specific, you start in small places, 
and then you expand to the, the larger text. Keep doing models, the more models, the better. Um, definitely vary the authors, make sure it's not all coming from the same person. If I had time, I'd do 50 models. Uh, of course I don't, but I try to get in as many as I can, just so the students get to see that while there are some conventions that always stay the same, there are a lot of stylistic choices that the students can apply to their own writing. Um, even if you've used a model, make sure you go back to it, help the students kind of crystallize whatever uh, the lesson was. And, and we might find more returning the second time after we, we've continued learning beyond that. Um, at least for my students, normally when I do these models and, and put most of the work in their hand um, as kind of evaluators, investigators, this is a new experience for them. So I don't expect them to, to really get it right away. Uh, another one of the reasons why I, I start small. Um, so it, 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 they do pick it up pretty quickly, but at first it can be a bit of a shock. So it takes extra heavy guidance early on. And um, because this is new for your students, maybe you do some of the work as more of a kind of uh, luxury type thing where you work out the steps in front of them um, and then you pass it on to the students and let them do it on their own. Uh, lastly, um, <clears throat> give students time to reflect. This is another thing I like to do where after the lesson has been completed, what you can do is um, tell the students, okay, take the next 20 minutes in this class, write down what you've learned, um, what what you think has helped you become a better writer and then write out some some issues that you still are having trouble processing and then we can share those out as a class if we want to or the students can keep it to themselves but just get them metacognitively thinking about the, the learning that took place and, and that's all i have here here's a list of some of the sources that i, I put together for um, the quotes and whatnot um down there at the at the bottom is my email address um, that's mjm111 at email.arizona.edu um, if this is something you're interested in or you have more questions or uh, even if you you want this slideshow I'm, I'm happy to to give you whatever you need and um, i don't know if we do questions or, or whatnot, but I, I can hang out if anyone has any questions. But that's all I have. So th okay. thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you for presenting. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe we can, uh, uh, we can show everyone. Yes. So that you see who is asking you a question. Mm. Do you have any questions, any comments, anything that you would like to say right now with reference to Michael's webinar? Anyone? Apart from uh, saying that uh, uh, the webinar has been very interesting and as usual, we feel stimulated to, uh, to, just, uh, to just do something differently. Yes, that's, that's the power of these webinars that uh, we meet the best of the best, and I wouldn't go that far. People, <laughs> and these people inspire our future uh, professional activities. Anybody? Any question? Any comment? Anything? Any positive message that maybe you would like to share with Michael? Have you come across any text that you found uh, did not work with this model? Um, I, I stick to what I know, and mostly I do formal writing stuff with this. Uh, those are the classes I'm generally assigned to, so it's pretty safe. Uh, those always work. Uh, if, I, if I thought there was a, a topic that was controversial, I probably wouldn't go for that. Mm -hmm. um, but for, for the most part, in, in a not broad experience, I, I've yet to find something that wouldn't work, but I'm sure it's out there. I don't want to make it sound like this is the... Um, this is the all cure for anything that has to do with writing. Uh, but I think there's a way to make it work for the most part. Thank you. Anybody else? 
If I may, I was just wondering uh, how responsive your students are uh, when teaching resumes. Mine are completely disinterested, <laughs> to, <laughs> to say the least. I can't really make them produce <laughs> sure. uh, real life resumes. Well, they lack the experience, that's for sure. But still, starting from the little, they have managed to achieve in their young lives. Still, I, I can't <laughs> really make it palatable. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Uh, tell me about <laughs> it. Yeah, for, for sure. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm a bit of a goof in the classroom. I try to keep it colorful. So sometimes I'll try to hunt down, spend a little too much, a little more time than I would like on, on LinkedIn to, to try to find some interesting ones. Um, like I, I was cracking myself up when I found the one with the uh, the meter for the skills, because if I was an employer and I was looking at it, I would say, uh, of course, this person's not going to give himself a two, right? Uh, I, I wouldn't. Well, we should be aware that we are teaching, I don't know, Gen Z these days. That's, that's so, true. Uh, so they are kind of likely to give themselves five out of five. I mean, oh, it, totally. I, I would perception. do. I would, that's I would have any fours. Mine would be entirely. But I would have a six, maybe in, in some. Of well, them. I am Gen X. I would never think about giving <laughs> me a five or a five. So this is such a yeah. huge never, gap. Never trust a millennial. Is, is my rule. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I have millennials in the family. So you know. Oh, I, I mean, I'm a, I'm a millennial. <laughs> I don't even trust myself. <laughs> That's good to know. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'll try to, to look up uh, something <laughs> funnier than a anything you can do, I you know. I mean, I don't know. I'm still trying. I don't, yeah, again, that's not a cure all, but um, it works for me. Yeah, that works. That's the most important thing. <laughs> okay, uh, there is one, uh, one comment in the chat box. Don't you get, uh, and there is a comment from Anya Olkiewicz, uh, don't you get the impression that too many models? Uh, can be overwhelming for some students. And yeah, of course, fair she, enough. She, she thanks you for the great presentation. <laughs> so I have to mention this. Oh, okay. Well, that, that's appreciated. Thank you. Um, I, I think maybe it could be overwhelming if, if you put them too close together. But um, I, I think as long as you're spacing out and you're, you're giving them appropriate time, uh, they, they, they can usually handle it. Uh, because at some point after the, the third or fourth one, maybe they, they start to get a little bored and, and annoyed with you because it, they, they're starting to see how similar some of them are, especially with, um, with, with something like formal essays. I mean, we're all teacher. We all grade these essays. At some point, uh, you rub your eyes and you wonder what essay are you on? You know, are you on the second one or are you on the fifth one? Because they, they, there are so many similarities that they blend a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and Elvira wrote, uh, uh, is it better you think to evaluate individually each student's piece of writing or discuss in forum the most common mistakes or problems? What do you think about this one? Uh, when I'm evaluating, usually uh, for, for the, I usually don't like to grade the rough drafts, but what I'll do is I'll, I'll find the trends that, that I see that I think most of the class is doing, or, or maybe not most, but a large um, percentage of the class is doing. And I will just list out those, those common mistakes or, or common um, going off the beating path that I find. And I'll say, peer edit yourselves and look for these specific things. Uh, I don't know if that answers the question, uh, but, but that's as far as evaluating uh, that's what I'm trying to do, but uh, I don't. Uh, for the final drafts, I wouldn't make that public. That would be a person by person. Okay, and there is one more appear in the meantime. Should we also? Uh, that is from Mikai. Uh, if I pronounce the name correctly, if not, I apologize. Should we also ditch assessment? and concentrate more on teaching learning process. I mean, we see evaluation as a final goal, 
but it's not so. Thank you. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I mean, if, if if I could find a way to, if if there wasn't someone asking me for the grades, I would never grade anything. Um, not, not because I'm lazy; it's just I don't like to. Um, yeah, if, if in a perfect world, I, I wouldn't assign grades to anyone. I would just um, just continue just just modeling and peer editing and and letting the students kind of get there on their own. But at the same time, it's not exactly a perfect world either, where I, I can think of a few students right now who, if I told them I wasn't grading anything, they would, I would never see that person again. Uh -huh. <laughs> they would disappear. <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't like to grade. And, and in a better world, I, I wouldn't be. Um, and if it was up to me, I wouldn't be. But we still have administration. We still have uh, students that don't want to be there. I personally, if I may express myself, Please. I personally be, believe in uh, in uh, the power of feedback. Yes, uh, I am. Uh, I especially like positive feedback because, uh, and then the grade comes at the end. Yes, that is the final thing. But they have to be convinced, uh, and they have uh, the right to disagree with me that what I. Uh, what these arguments that I have presented to them are conv uh, are convincing for them, uh, and I usually start with uh, with positive feedback. I, so I tell them these are the elements that you should build on because these are your unique selling points, your strengths, something that uh, that makes you different from other people. Yes. So even if you miss some of those other skills or some language skills, whatever these skills are, or business skills as I teach business English, you, you have these, yes? So uh, make sure that you build on them and this way you will be stronger in these areas and different from others. Uniqueness matters in contemporary world. Yes, that's, that's why. Totally, yeah. Okay, so I, uh, since I'm beginning to talk, I think yeah. it's time to, uh, to close the webinar, thanking you very heartily, uh, waving at you, those of you who are visible can wave uh, at, at Michael so that Michael sees your smiling faces and uh, he knows that his late evening time spent with us has not been wasted. Okay, thank you oh, very no, much. No, never wasted. No, thanks for having <laughs> me. This was nice. Thank uh, you all and see you at the next webinar. And uh, uh, promise to keep in touch with us, Michael. Oh, yeah, you, you have my... Um, it, do, <laughs> would you like for me to share with you the, the slide deck? Uh, my email's on there or I can... I'll, I'll throw it in the chat too. Um, okay, but, throw it yeah, in the chat, feel, yes. Feel free to reach out whenever. Thank you. That was that was the best message of this evening. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. And the certificate has been provided. It was provided exactly at 20 minutes past nine. Yes. So you can find it 20 minutes past nine. But just in case, maybe I will uh I will provide it once again at the end. Yes. So I provide it again. So everybody uh, knows that the certificate is there. And uh, as I can hear, no complaints. So nobody has had a problem with the certificate. Oh, someone has just joined us at the very <laughs> last moment. Does he get one? Or did you get one? <laughs> just, in, you know, but, you know, we shouldn't think negatively about people, you know, because some people oh, no, 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 speak okay. out of the room, yes, and they want to rejoin us. So that's how I treat those people coming, uh, <laughs> let's say, 25 past nine, yes? <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much once again, and see you next time. I will now stop recording.